Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The part of God's word for our consideration this fourth Sunday of Advent is our gospel text for today from the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she was greatly troubled by the statement and was wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Listen, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, even though she was called barren, and this is her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible for God. Then Mary said, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, have you ever seen a miracle? I mean a real miracle. I know we say sarcastically when one of our leaders does the right thing or makes the right decision, oh, that was a miracle. Or when someone who is ordinarily quite irresponsible comes through and does something they're supposed to, oh, a miracle. No, no, I mean a miracle. Have you ever seen a miracle? And I'm, again, not talking about that miraculous catch that that wide receiver made yesterday or that miraculous comeback by that basketball team with just three minutes left in the game. The 1969 Miracle Mets, right? So far out of first place, so late in the season, and somehow came back to win the pennant. Or the miracle on ice, right? Our young amateur hockey team finally defeating the, the mighty Red Army team in the 1980. Olympics in hockey. But those weren't really miracles, were they? Shouldn't a miracle be something more, I don't know, supernatural? Like a miracle, like when we see an auto accident, the, the car is just absolutely totaled, but the people walk away unscathed. Or maybe like when they find the small child in the rubble of a building three or four days after the earthquake has destroyed that building. Or the times I stood in the delivery room, four different times, holding that little precious gift from God, and I couldn't help think, that's a miracle. But was it a miracle? Well, yeah, God did those things, but didn't he do them in a normal way, the way that he has set up for things like that to be able to happen? I mean, a real miracle, something where God steps in and throws aside the laws of nature and does something absolutely supernatural. How about that? that? That statue of the crying Mary in Orlando, right? There's a big statue of Mary at the church and it's got a, like a gray streak there that looks like tears coming down. And They've been watching this closely and carefully for years and now after a number of years, finally the diocese has come out and said, yes, this has been verified as a miracle. Or that uh, bread pan in Laredo, Texas, a couple weeks ago that had the virgin, the blessed virgin was burned on the bottom of that after it went through the, through the oven. Or a number of years ago, wasn't it up here in Sacramento at the Vietnamese Martyrs Catholic Church, right? They had that statue that seemed to be crying red tears. And people were coming, thousands of people were flocking and just, I mean, actually stopping traffic, filling up the streets to look at this statue. And a lot of people were getting really emotional and a lot of people were getting really kind of skeptical, and the church came out at that time and said, well, a lot of people can see things like this through the eyes of faith, and that makes them miraculous. It doesn't necessarily say that it's a supernatural event. Oh, we're not saying that miracles cannot happen, but in this case, 
the bishop is waiting to see what will happen. I think that's their way of saying we don't know. We don't know what's going on. But if you ask all the people that thronged around to look at it, a lot of them were absolutely certain this is a miracle. And a lot of them were absolutely certain it was not a miracle. And they're wondering, well, I don't see her crying, but if she's crying, what's she crying about? And what is the message? I mean, if God's going to suspend the laws of nature to give us a miracle, shouldn't it have some kind of a meaning? Some kind of a message? Not be just some, you know, some kind of a card trick and, wow, that was kind of neat. But shouldn't there be a clearer message if God's going to do a miracle? Well, here as we look at the case of this young lady named Mary, and she finds herself smack dab in the middle of what is a real miracle. Something so amazing she has to ask over and over, how will this be? How will this be? Because Christmas for this young lady meant an absolutely impossible situation with an amazingly powerful solution. See, Mary could tell right away this wasn't going to be your everyday, ordinary situation that she was gotten into here. Her first clue might have been the messenger. It's not very often that an angel pops in on someone as God drops into her little concrete world this spirit being who makes this huge announcement. See, maybe if it was closer to Jerusalem, the, the capital and the, the center of the religious everything, but man, not up here in the sticks of Nazareth. So this was something shocking. And so we're not too surprised that Luke tells us Mary was surprised. as He says she was greatly troubled by the statement and was wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Literally, the word is she's arguing back and forth in her own mind about what's going on here. But she doesn't have to struggle for very long, does she? Because this does have a clear message. This time, God's messenger, this angel Gabriel, gives her the meaning right away. He says, do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Well, that's the answer, but kind of brings up more questions than it answers for this, this young lady. And she says, well, how will this be? Probably a mild reaction compared to what you or I might have said in a situation like this. How will this be? She's not doubting what the angel she's saying. She's not doubting the ability of God to come through on what he says he's going to do. She's not asking for a sign or proof like so many people had before and so many people have since. She is simply wishing in humility that she could have it explained a little further for her. And I'm glad she did ask for it to be explained because then it gets explained for us as well. This, this situation that was described to her, it, it was impossible. After all, she's a virgin. She can't conceive and have a child. She knew that that came about by sexual relations. She had never had sexual relations with any, every, anyone. And she knew that that is the way that God had set up for having children. You cannot be a virgin and a mother at the same time. But there's even more to this. Not only would her conception be supernatural, but this baby she was going to have was going to be supernatural as well. Gabriel says, he will be great and will be called the son of the Most High. This little baby was going to be different than any other baby ever born. Yeah, her relative Elizabeth was supernaturally pregnant too. Not as a virgin, but she was well beyond the, the age of childbearing. And God had granted her an exception to be able to become pregnant and have a baby. But the baby wasn't going to be this special. Sarah, another one of God's people, had been 90 years old. And God set aside the normal rules of nature and let her get pregnant too. But her child was a normal child. And as God stepped in in other situations and gave this gift to people who had been sterile or barren, none of their children were going to be like this one. This one Mary was going to have, to be, was going to have was going to be so different that the prophet Isaiah had been inspired by God to write 700 years before this, for the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and name him Emmanuel. The baby would be Emmanuel, Hebrew for with us God. This baby was going to be God, literally God with us. And Mary was going to be his mother. Absolutely impossible 
But wait, there's even more. Gabriel's message now tells Mary, and you are to name him Jesus. Wait, wait, that's not more, is it? That's the easy part, right? Naming him, that's not going to be that difficult. They're going to name him Jesus. A lot of people had that name back then. That wasn't going to be the impossible part. The impossible part was what this name Jesus actually means. It means the Lord is salvation. And that should be impossible. Because this Lord is the same Lord who demands, be holy, therefore, as I, the Lord. Your God, am holy. And he means it. He not just only expects, he demands absolute perfection as the only thing he could see. And yet, when he looks at us, that's not what he sees. Instead, he sees rebellion, fighting against him, sinful attitudes, sinful words, sinful actions, all of it making us his enemies on the other side, on the opposite side of the fence from God. So when he says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that means that all have sinned, everyone, and fall short of salvation, being okay with him, being able to go into his heaven. So this name that she was going to give her little baby boy, Jesus, the Lord is salvation, that's impossible too. An absolutely impossible situation. In fact, one time when Jesus was trying to explain to people how much of an impossible situation that was, he said it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And to make sure that nobody thought, oh, that's hard, or just, just anybody can make it through, but maybe not the Pharisees. Or, well, the, the camel might have to get down on his knees, or you might have to take off the backpack with all your riches. No, he went on to, to say, as his disciples got so frustrated, they said, well, then who can be saved? And he says, you're right, no one. With man, he said, with people, this is absolutely impossible. There's no way. This is an impossible situation. Impossible for a virgin to have a child. Impossible for Mary's son to be God. Impossible for anyone to be right with God and be saved. It's an impossible situation. And yet, as Jesus was talking about that, he says, with people, this is impossible. He didn't stop there. That wasn't a period. That was a comma. He says, but not with God. Because with God, everything is possible. And that's what this announcement to Mary was really all about. Where she and we and everyone else were facing an absolutely impossible situation. Here comes the solution. And it's powerful. It's amazing. Not just that God can do the impossible, but that he would do this impossible thing for us. I mean, if you're thinking what to get for a Christmas present, what are you going to get for the person who disrespects you the most? What Christmas present are you planning to get and shop for and buy and wrap for that person that is your, your mortal enemy? The person who most goes against you, the most makes it look like everything you says is just stupid all the time and doesn't really want to listen to you. What would you get for that person? There are some companies that will send those people some dead flowers or black roses, roses or even uh, sealed bags of, of certain animal droppings with a, uh, an appropriate card if you wish. But you, if you're going to get your worst enemy something for Christmas, what would you get them? God tells us our sins made us his absolute worst enemies. And yet, what did he get us for Christmas? His own son? A way to be right with him forever? And here's how. As he shows this most powerful solution to the most impossible situation. Mary's told, for the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In this incredible miracle, God, the Holy Spirit, is going to start a life in the womb of this virgin. And what it took, it says the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. It's the same word that's used at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, showed evidence of himself that he was really with his people, really progressing this plan of salvation. It's also the same word that would be used in the Old Testament when they would talk about the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle, and then the glory of God would overshadow it. There'd be this glorious light and lightning and smoke and rumbling, and it would settle over that that picture of God's presence so God's people could know that God was really with them. It's a miracle. Far outside the normal rules of nature, the way God usually does things among us, the Spirit of the Most High God, 
would be responsible for bringing into existence Jesus Christ's human nature. He was going to make it this solution so, so powerful that this virgin could not only have a son, but that this son is going to be Jesus, true God in every way, and still true human at one and the same time. He made a way so that this one could be true and almighty, eternal God, but still have flesh and blood, a body and a soul. The impossible, this Savior who is 100% God and 100% man at one and the same time, and with very good reason, because that was the only solution. That was the only way to solve our impossible situation of how to be saved. This God-man, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, that's the only one who could do it. None of us could do it. Not all of us put together could do it. But this one who took our place, was born our brother, was born under the law, the Bible says, so that he could be in a position of having to be responsible to God for all those laws of his that we don't keep and are supposed to keep, and he would do it perfectly. See, he was born of a human mother just like us, but unlike us, because of this miraculous conception, he did not share our original sin. He was the only absolutely sinless, perfect baby ever. And he stayed that way for his whole life. So that the letter to the Hebrews tells us, in him we have one who is tempted in every way, just like we are, yet he was without sin. Only true God could keep this law perfectly. That was the only way to provide us with the perfect righteousness God demands. This one who could take our place, but then do it perfectly. He had to be man, but then even looking at the other side of the equation, how to get rid of the sin that was already there, required a sacrifice, required a life. But none of our lives could do it. Psalm 49 says, no one can give to God a ransom. For the ransom of soul, for our souls is too costly. Any payment would fall short. The infinite debt caused by our sins required an infinite price. And here it is. Jesus, true God. True God, God who cannot suffer, who cannot die. But here's true God with nerve cells and blood and flesh. Here's a way God himself could die for us, a price expensive enough to pay for everyone's sins. Now there's a miracle. A miracle not to go flock at and take pictures and selfies and, and, and throng, make pilgrimages to see, but a miracle to live our lives by. Because yeah, God did do a miracle. He suspended the natural laws. He did something supernatural. And he keeps on doing that as he uses his powerful supernatural word in our hearts. The, that word that gave us faith is the word that keeps us in the faith and strengthens that faith and, and gives us a whole different concept of what impossible means. I remember as a child often working in things with my dad, I'd get to a point where I'd be really frustrated because something would get really difficult. And he'd say, well, if it was easy, everyone could do it, right? There are some parts of the United States Armed Forces that have recently taken, kind of as an unofficial slogan, the difficult we do immediately. The impossible is going to take a little longer. That's the outlook you and I have as God's people on everything. Everything. God, this God who did the impossible for us, he also promises to get us through all the different difficulties of life. And even those impossible things, instead of being something scary or something that makes us nervous or depressed, it's actually going to be something exciting to see how God gets us through even that. Because we have a God who accomplished the absolutely impossible of saving us, and promises to get us through everything else to that eternal life that's on the other end of this. And even when it really is impossible, that's okay too, because that's where God takes over. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to declare and confess the faith he's given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. 